so on to the next uh, presentation. So next we have preparing to hand count policies, practices, and procedures. And presenting as part of that panel is Brian Kasky. And Brian is the Director of Elections serving in the Kansas Secretary of State's office. He began his work in the office as a student intern in the summer of 1990. He was appointed director in February of 2015 after serving as assistant director for several, several years. He has worked for five secretaries of state during his tenure in the Secretary of State's office. Then we have Jason Hancock, who has been Idaho's deputy secretary of state over the elections division since 2020. Prior to this, in a career going back to 1996, he has been the director of the South Dakota Legislative Research Council, deputy chief of staff at the Idaho Department of Education, and a budget and policy analyst for the Idaho Legislative Services Office. And then we have uh, Trisha Piezu, and Trisha is the assistant secretary of state slash election director for the state of New Hampshire a role that she's had since 2019. Previously, Trisha served in the local uh, government as a deputy city clerk and a city clerk overseeing hundreds of local election officials. As a clerk, she served at the New Hampshire City and Town Clerks Executive Board. She also served on the New England Association of City and Town Clerks Executive Board, as well as the New England Municipal Clerks Institute and Academy attaining her international certi certification as a master municipal clerk. So, uh, oh, and then we have uh, Amy Cohen, who Amy needs no introduction because she is uh, what makes everything run here. Um, and she's going to be filling in for uh, Mark Velashin from, um, from Nevada. So please take it away. Thank you, Megan. Uh, well, I am no Mark, but I will do my best uh, to do him proud because this is actually a session that uh, he has been uh, sort of the, the brain behind um, because f for months uh, among NASAD members, we've been talking about um, hand ballot hand counting policies and procedures um, because as many of you know, there is uh, a move in some places in that direction. Um, so I'm joined here by uh, representatives from three states who have uh, policies and procedures around hand counting ballots or um, recounting ballots. Um, so to start, um, could each of you provide a short overview, maybe two minutes each, um, of your hand count process or in Jason's case, your hand recount process? So we'll go with Brian first. Thank you, Amy. So I don't believe our process is any different than probably what all of you already do. Um, Essentially what we have is we have, we start off with a counting board. Um, each counting board has three people. Uh, one person's in charge, he's the supervising judge, and the supervising judge um, directs the other two. Uh, the first part we do is of course we separate the ballots from the envelope if they are in envelopes. If not, we, um, we then number each of the ballots and then announce them publicly so that everyone knows exactly how many ballots that are being counted in this particular session by this particular board. Then the supervising judge will read the contents of the ballot, and then the other two people will tally them on tally sheets. So every single board has one reader and two tally, uh, two people tallying. The second person will then verify what the first person said, have their own tally, and then the third person has a tally sheet and then we reconcile that so every single time every single board reconciles that that's where the fun begins because as you all know no one sees things the same um, which is why we do things in batches generally we recommend do a batch of 50 or 100 so that you don't get very far off of your counts and if a if the three people are unable to determine the voter intent then we challenge that and we leave that to the county board of canvassers to make a final determination so at a high level, that's what we do. I was told to speak for two minutes and I far exceeded that. So uh, I will defer to my colleagues here. Thank you. So uh, as Amy mentioned, uh, you know, what Idaho has recently established here is a hand recount process. It's part of a post-election audit process that we do. Uh, we actually started doing it last year 
kind of informally without uh, any kind of legis legislative or statutory structure around it because there was there was this guy uh, making a lot of allegations, this guy who sells, I don't know, betting products or something. And, uh, you know, for a long time, we kind of ignored it. But, uh, you know, eventually he came out with some, actually some very specific allegations of exactly how many votes had supposedly been switched electronically from one candidate to another candidate. And so we thought, well, you know, if we could get a few county clerks to go along, that's, that's actually a pretty easy thing to check. So, you know, that's what we did. And that's where we started doing this process. And since the allegation was that, you know, things had been switched electronically, we thought, well, you know, let's, let's do a, a hand recount process then because you can't switch that electronically. Uh, and, and so we did that last year, and then we actually uh, got some legislation into code this year uh, for how we do that. Uh, you know, our, our procedures are, are really pretty similar to yours. It's, you know, the three-person team. Uh, the Secretary of State's employee uh, is the team lead, but then we also uh, appoint two talliers, and the two political parties each appoint a tallier. So there's always a Republican and a Democrat who are uh, helping keep that tally. Uh, you know, the way we do it is, uh, you know, the, the team lead will, will examine the ballot and determine who the vote is for and will say, you know, Trump or Biden or whatever, uh, and will hold it up for the talliers to look at. And unless they have an objection, that's what they mark down. Uh, and, and like you, we're kind of doing it in batches because each row can only have 60 tally marks on it. So, you know, once the first candidate hits 60, you know, we stop and we reconcile. Uh, and, and then we put these, you know, colored divider papers on the, the stacks of ballots as we're going through them uh, every time we stop and reconcile. So that way, if, if we ever get off, we don't have to go all the way back to the beginning to figure out where we got off. So uh, essentially, that's, you know, like I said, it's, it's very similar to the process that you guys have. So for us, we have a combination of both our optic scan devices <clears throat> and those hand count towns. So the, one of the methods which you hear, heard here is like the read and mark method. We basically have that as well, and we kind of follow the same thing with the tally sheets. We have a moderator who's in charge of our polling location, so he's going to be, he or she will be the one that will determine which method we use, because we do have two methods. We have an additional method. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of our moderators find our second method easier, but we do the tally sheets as well, and we, we make sure we're counting any overvote, any undervotes, um, any blank ballots, so that when you get to that stack of 50, you know that tally sheet should equal exactly what you have there. Um, our other method is our stack and sort method. So they go race by race and they're sitting there looking at it and saying, okay, there's, again, we're still doing it in batches as well, but they're looking at the, the first race. Let's say if it's a governor's race, they look at candidate A, candidate A goes in one pile, candidate B goes in another pile, candidate C, if there's one in another pile, then if there's any write-in, if there's an undervote because nobody decided to vote or an overvote, that'll be in there. For us, if the voter intent is determined by the person marking it, if they're not sure, then it will be the moderator's decision as to what the voter intent is. And then uh, the moderator's decision is law for that evening. And then if there's so much that's challenged, then they can, the candidate can also request a recount as well. But with the sort and stack method, they feel it's a more confident way to do it and it's an easier way to do it than the read and write. Trisha, on that point, um, is there a difference <coughs> in sort of accuracy or time between the two methods? Or is it really just preference when, when your jurisdictions are making that decision? I think it's more the preference of the jurisdiction. It all depends, I think, if it's a state election or for a local election, because on a local election, some of them can have up to 10 pages of a ballot. So and for them, it may be easier to do the read write on that one instead of the sort stack. Um, so for, for Brian and Tricia, um, when 
And and for for Jason, when do you use hand, hand counting? Do you do jurisdictions have to tell you in advance that they're going to be doing hand counting? Are there specific kinds of races that can that have to be have to use tabulators or that um, are are they allowed to sort of make that decision themselves? So in, in Kansas, there are five different times that we go to a hand count. Um, the first is for UOCAVA ballots. If they are returned electronically, those, uh, with the way that Kansas does it, it produces a piece of paper that generally is not scannable. So all of those are counted by hand. Uh, the second category is ballots that cannot be read by the machine for whatever reason. Uh, we'll talk about this later, I, I assume, but. Kansas has a very specific law that prohibits the remarking of ballots. There are lots of jurisdictions that do that. In fact, most of our counties would prefer that method, but the legislature specifically prohibited the policy of remarking a ballot to be scanned. And so any ballot that cannot be read must be hand counted. The third time is for our post-election audits. Our post-election audit uh, requires that every single county do that audit by hand and then compare the results of the hand count with the machine count. So that's the third category. Uh, the fourth category are recounts. A candidate can request a recount by hand. They have to pay for it and so it is more, it is less common because uh, candidates do have to post a bond for that, but that's the fourth category. And then the fifth category is somewhat new. Um, Kansas has a number of very small jurisdictions, uh, you know, 2,000 registered voters or less, and for uh, decades they counted by hand even with, with their ballot marking device or in the old DREs. Uh, 2,000, we finally had the last county purchase a ballot scanner, so every county was automated uh, in 2000, and now due to many factors I don't want to talk about, uh, we have a handful of counties that in 2022 are counting by hand. They, their county commissions have banned the use of their tabulators. We still have the uh, you know, ballot marking device for voters with disabilities, but um, they have banned the use of tabulators. So we are seeing at least a small handful of counties that will count everything by hand in 2022, which we haven't done in over 20 years. So those are the five very specific reasons in Kansas. Uh, there's uh, three <clears throat> instances in which you can have hand counting go on in Idaho. You know, first of all, any county that wants to can hand count. They can they can absolutely do that. They don't need our permission. They can do that. Uh, that number has been shrinking for years. The number of counties that actually do that. I think we're down to about seven of our counties still use hand count. And you know, for some of them, these are very small counties. It probably makes sense to just continue hand counting. You know, when you've got a county population under 3,000 people, it, it makes more sense to just hand count. Um, you know, second is when there's a, a recount, uh, part of the, the process is if it's a county that used machines to count in the first place, what they have to do is pull out kind of a random sample of ballots from the stack that needs to be recounted and then <clears throat> hand count those and then run that through the machine <clears throat> and make sure that they're basically in agreement. Doesn't have to be perfect, but they have to be within a small fraction of a percent. Uh, and, and as long as they're, they're in that relative agreement, then you can run the rest of the ballots through the machine. And then the third is our post-election audit, which is a, a new thing that uh, that was a bill that we got passed uh, this last legislative session. We did our first official one that was statutorily authorized um, here at the uh, end of May. <clears throat> and when we do that, you know, we're going to basically pull randomly uh, two out of three of our largest counties, uh, three out of eight of our medium counties, and three out of 33 of our smaller counties, uh, and we're going to do a post-election audit of them. Uh, for the larger and the medium ones and kind of the bigger of the small ones, uh, we would also then do a, a random uh, a random precinct sample as well because you know some of these counties are really too big for us to do a full 
hand recount of, so we'll do a sample. Uh, but for the smaller ones, we'll, we'll hand recount the whole county. So for New Hampshire, we have over, a little over 100 towns that currently that are hand counted towns, and they've been hand counted towns for the longest time, probably since the inception of the towns and everything. Um, the other ones that do use the optical scan devices and everything like that, they will still have hand counts, as Ryan alluded to, because as we know, the UOCAVA ballots that we send out, uh, especially most of them now, we know are emailed. And remember when we used to have to mail phys ballots and we couldn't email. So those definitely will be hand counted, as well as any ballot the machine will, not re re uh, will take for one reason or the other. But also new this year for us in New Hampshire is the overvote law that was just passed. So any ballot current before prior to this, an overvoted ballot would go through the machine and be count all the races would be counted by but that one race that was overvoted. Now any ballot that is overvoted will be kicked out and has to be put in the hand count slot. So that will be hand counted as well now. Um, and everything needs to be tracked as far as the as far as how many overvoted ballots and everything. And of course, during the recounts, we also will hand count everything. And matter of fact, we have another new law change that states that any state representative that requests a recount, up to 10 of them, if we have, when we do have many recounts, um, we also have to recount in that city or town, city ward or town, um, one of the top races on the ballot as well. And that's all going to be all hand counted. And depending on how many names are on the ballot, we'll either use the sort and stack method or we will also use the tally. But when we use the tally, it was interesting to hear Jason meant it, mentioned it during COVID, as we know, everything hit. So we have now cameras set up so that we have the candidates representative on our side, on the other side. We have one person that's look, putting the ballot underneath the camera so everybody can see. And then the, the tally sheet is on the other. And if we're doing it that way and we'll be tallying it so there's, they can see that information right there. When you're doing these larger hand counts, um, do you run in shifts or do you run 24 hours? And is there a limit to the number of hours that any one person can work? I imagine it's hard on the eyes to do that for a really long time. <laughs> So officially, that decision is up to each of the 105 counties we have. There's no state law that governs that. As a practical matter, um, each of the counties operates through normal business hours. They will do the hand count uh, generally from 8 to 5. They'll break for lunch. They'll break once in the morning. They'll break once in the afternoon. And then generally, they will stop. Um, however, there are a handful of deadlines that will... Um, once we get close to, we'll have to work a little bit in the evening, but we do not go 24 seven, um, for the reasons that you said, um, we recommend basically two hours break, two hours break. Um, and normally we can get that done in three or four days. Um, but I, I there's no way that I would run 24 seven. Plus we would, we would have a hard time finding people. It's hard enough as it is. And so I would not want to do that. I'm not aware that uh, we've ever had uh, a situation, you know, with our hand count counties where we weren't able to get the election result on election night from them. Uh, one of the ways that they're able to deal with this is if they've got a little bit bigger election with a lot of different things on the ballot, a lot of different, you know, races they're going to have to count. We have a provision in, in Idaho law that allows them to... Uh, you know, essentially not wait until the polls are closed to start counting. What they can do is they can have two ballot boxes and they can rotate them. And so you'll have a counting team in the back that's counting the ballots as, as they're being cast, essentially. And you just continually kind of rotate the ballot box, the empty one and the one with the, the ballots in it. And so that way, you know, they've got kind of a running count as they're going through the day. Uh, and then, you know, by the time the polls close, they just have, you know, that ballot box that's out there in the room that kind of has the last group of ballots in it. And they pull that ballot box back and, uh, and count them and, and they're done. And so, you know, they've gone pretty, pretty quickly, really. 
uh, and, and you know, it helps that these are smaller counties. You know, for for the post-election counts that we're doing, you know, we've always been able to get every county that we're doing uh, done in one day, and we kind of figure on basically you know, three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. Uh, one team can get through about 2,100 ballots, we figure, in a day like that at about 350 an hour. And keep in mind, though, we're only counting one race when we do our post-election audit. We're not counting all the races on that ballot. We pick one race that we're going to check. Uh, so that helps it go fairly quickly. So with us, it's up to the moderator to um, make sure that they have the staff that they need to make sure they can get through the election. We always recommend that they bring in, at the end of the day, additional staff that's fresh, try to find somebody that's an accountant or a CPA that's good with numbers and everything like that to help with the account. Um, like um, Jason said, we haven't had any issues as far as getting our results on election evening. The New Hampshire Constitution does make it that they have to provide the results election evening, even if it's going into two, three, four o'clock in the morning, then they're done that as a local official. So, um, and that was through uh, using an optical device, but um, we have never had issues with that. But yeah, we, we always say to them, find somebody that can come in at the end of the night that can help you with this process. Tricia, you mentioned that um, you had like video feed or that you were doing it um sorry you had observers who were uh ob observing via mm -hmm. video um in 2020 were they allowed and in general are your observers allowed to make protests or um, participate in some way or are they truly there just watching what's happening so the observers they, I, they weren't there for video but the observers can be there um when the counting is going on it's a public Doors cannot be closed to the polling location, um, and they can't be any closer than four feet from the rail. So they can observe the process, but they cannot question the vote and how the vote is being given by which candidate and what's being marked on there. They can speak to the moderator about it. If the moderator has concerns, again, because the fact that they are going through and reconciling in batches, they can look at that batch if there's a question. But if there's any other concern and the moderator feels the process is going properly, then basically they would state to the individual that the candidate can always request a recount. In um, Idaho and Kansas, are observers allowed to protest or weigh in in any way during the process? Um, you know, we have poll watchers that are there for the regular elections process and for the the vote tabulation that goes on poll watchers cannot lodge objections though uh, kind of like with new hampshire you know if they have a question you know they can ask somebody a question hey what is this and, and you know some some clerks get a little tetchy about that uh that you know they want they want them to sit, you know, preferably like in a corner on a stool with a <laughs> with a pointy cap on and, and not make any noise. But um, yeah, you know, we we feel like it's it's better generally if you if you've got a, a watcher that's been appointed by a candidate. If they if they see something they don't understand, it's better to just let them ask the question and explain it to them because. You know, they're, they're going to assume something nefarious, probably, if they don't have this explained to them. So we'd rather have them ask the question. But no, they can't lodge any kind of objections. We do have, um, during our uh, elections, like our primary elections, you know, the parties can appoint what are called poll challengers. And they can actually challenge whether somebody is uh, qualified to vote or not. And they can lodge that challenge. Uh, but they, they can't challenge whether or not something is, you know, a vote for this candidate or that candidate. They can't challenge, you know, as part of that vote tabulation process. And then as far as our post-election audit process goes, I mean, we've kind of we've kind of folded them in to that process by having the parties appoint the talliers. So, you know, we've got a Republican and we've got a Democrat sitting right there. And I mean, I've I've been the team lead on three of these. And so, you know, I'm the one that, you know, shows them the ballot and I'm saying it's a vote for so-and-so. And if they disagree, then, 
you know, they have the opportunity to object at that time, and we'll talk it through at that point, but ultimately it's my call. Uh, so Kansas is not any different, but I'm going to go down a slight rabbit trail until Amy hits me. Um, so it, it's observation only. Uh, authorized pool agents are allowed to be present anytime boats are being counted, and so it's observation only. Uh, but the way Kansas works, and I'm curious if everyone else is like this, which is a rhetorical question, you can find me later, is at no point can a third party challenge a vote in any of our process. You're allowed to be present and you can watch, but if you disagree with the decision by the board, if it should count or not, um, there's no way to challenge that um, by a third party or by a candidate. And once they make a decision, it goes to the county board of canvassers who will rubber stamp it. If they, uh, the board can challenge a vote and send that to the county board of canvassers and they can make a determination, but once that determination made is final, when you request a recount, you are just recounting what's already been decided to be counted or not. It does not review the determination if it should count or not. And so I'm not aware that any observer can challenge a vote except by after the election certified by filing a formal objection in a primary or by going to court and filing a contest. So I, I know this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I'm curious offline if, if that's where everyone is. We just don't allow anyone to challenge anything until it's certified, and then I guess we'll see you in court. So That wasn't too bad, Brian. <laughs> um, so... If you were starting from scratch, if your state didn't have these policies and procedures in place and you had to, you know, begin at the beginning, what would you do differently from what you have uh, in your current either law or administrative code or procedure? I'm going to go to Jason first because he seems eager. <laughs> well, um, you know, our... Our post-election audit process is so new. I mean, we passed it into law this year that it's it's built pretty much the way we wanted it to be built. I mean, we, you know, I, I wrote the bill, so I shouldn't be complaining about it. Um, but you know, it, it just in terms of of how how we've run it, you know, now that we've done one of these officially for the first time under this statutory structure. You know, I think when we do it uh, this November, you know, we'll probably want to put a little bit more of our own Secretary of State resources uh, into the, the ballot sorting process, at least, you know, in those counties where that's an issue. You know, some counties have their ballots well sorted by precinct, and where this comes into play is really more with your absentee and your early vote ballots. You know, the election day ballots are obviously already sorted by precinct, but you know, for those absentee and, and early votes. You know, some counties have, have sorted those out by precinct, um, and, and they just do that kind of, you know, on the, on the intake with the absentee ballots. Uh, so, it, it, you know, that's already taken care of. But, you know, what we found is there's, you know, it ends up taking a lot of time, you know, where you have a county that hasn't sorted those uh, that way to go through all their absentee ballots and all their early ballots and get those sorted, you know, where, where we've just got a sampling of certain precincts that we want to look at, you know, that, that takes some time to sort those out. We did put some provisions into the law where, you know, if a county is particularly sophisticated, as our largest county is, and can give us election results and post them to their website, you know, by batch and by early voting machine, um, then, you know, we can, we can randomly draw those in lieu of looking at the absentee or early vote ballots associated with the precinct that we drew. Uh, and so that's, that's nice. That made Ada County really easy to do. Uh, but we're probably going to have to put some more resources into the sort that ends up being a real time sink. Trisha? So if we didn't have anything already said, I think we need to look at the beginning and say, okay, this is the bayout, ballot layout. What do we want to do? We'd also look at looking to the election officials. We always ask our election officials, 
what do you see? What can we help to do? What can we do better to make your job easier and everything like that? So we would look at it. I mean, when you think about starting from scratch, I think the most in easiest way is the read and mark method because the fact is you've got the ballot, you'll have a tally sheet type thing, but definitely reach out to your election officials too to see what they what they like, maybe because they have a different idea in mind. Maybe they thought of something different as far as the best way to be able to mark and hand count these ballots. I should add that some of the counties when they do hand counting, the way that they are able to speed it up a little bit is instead of the, the three-person team and process that I described, they'll have a, a four-person team. And so rather than, you know, the person who's, you know, looking at the ballot, examining it and saying, you know, this is a vote for Smith, and then showing the ballot to the talliers to see if they agree, and then having them tally it, what they'll do is they'll have a fourth person who just kind of sits to the side of the person who's saying, that that's a vote for Smith. And so the person who has the ballot looks at it and says, vote for Smith, and never turns it around for the talliers to look at. And so the person over the other, over that person's shoulder is just kind of looking at it. And if, if you make a mistake, uh, they'll generally catch it. So since you're not having to flip it around and show it to people, just in terms of kind of time and motion, that ends up going a little bit quicker. So if you can add a fourth person, you can possibly speed it up a bit. I, I have three things I would do differently, one of which is because I need to be in control of everything and can't let anything go. But but training is one of those. You know, we, Each county is responsible for hiring their board and, and training their boards. And we have statewide standards on what constitutes a vote for the various types of equipment and ballots. Uh, but I think we could do a better job of showing actual examples. And personally, I would like to be involved in that other than trusting 105 counties to do it correctly. Um, so that's one thing I would change. Um, I think we do a good job, but it's, I, I believe we could do better, especially with um, giving them practice and kind of grading them on what constitutes a vote and what doesn't. I think there can be some discrepancies there. Uh, the second and third are related. It's the timing and transparency of when we do the hand counts. Um, we are not required to uh, produce those results on election night. And Kansas is a, a postmark state, meaning if your ballot's postmarked on or before election night and we receive it that week, those are still counted. So our unofficial election night results are being updated Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And with that, counties are including their hand counts because some counties will do it on election night if they don't have very many some will do it on wednesday some will do it on thursday and i think that does a disservice to the candidates um, and the voters on exactly why the results keep updating it's not just more ballots coming in it's the timing of when these hand counts are released and um, i don't have an answer to that yet because that requires the counties to listen to me but that's one area that I, I believe that we could do better. Um, you, all, you all see this, like our results are never static. We have election night and then Wednesday afternoon, they change again, Thursday, they change again. And we ne need to do a better job of telling everybody, this is what's changing and why it's changing. So those, that's what I would change. So Amy, I'd like to add on to what Brian said about the training. I think that's really important and we will do the training and everything. And matter of fact, we're in the process of putting out a 400 page election procedure manual right now to our election officials where this guidance is in and it has been in there. So they always can also comment on there and come up with a different way. But I think training is really important um, as far as it, but it's interesting to hear, even though we're doing hand counts, how different it is because when Jason was saying about showing the ballot. We don't show the ballot. They're just sitting there working with the ballot and marking the sheets that they're doing that. It's only during the recount process that we would be showing the ballot to those candidates' representatives to see whether or not they are going to question that vote or not, the way that the mark ballot is marked. So, um, Brian, you mentioned the counting board, and it sounds like all of you have sort of similar bodies of, you know, groups of people who who are are doing the counting in this way are there other boards like ballot duplication boards or any other 
um, similar um, other bodies that need to be uh, working concurrently? Uh, yes, we don't have a duplication board because we can't, but we have our, a separate write-in board that is tasked with tabulating all write-in votes. And so simultaneously with the hand count, we will have a separate board also comprised of three people um, that are reviewing all write-in votes. And so those are, are concurrent, um, but that's all we have because we, we do not remark or any other type of ballot adjudication. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, the, I mean, the purpose of a duplication board where you're duplicating a ballot is generally because you've got something that the machine can't read or it's a damaged ballot or something like that. And so in the context of hand counts, you know, we don't, we don't really need to duplicate anything. We're just examining the ballot that's in front of us. So it's really, it's not so much a duplication, it's an adjudication. Uh, and in our post-election audit process, like I said, it's really, you know, ultimately it's up to that Secretary of State's team lead person uh, to make that determination, but it's in consultation with the Republican and Democrat representatives who are there. Generally, they, they agree. I, I've never seen a, a case where they've disagreed on it. It's usually pretty obvious. So we don't have a duplication board. Everything is being handled that evening uh, for the polls closed by the moderator. So it's his determination. And if there's any, any question of how the intent of that voter is, he will ask the clerk, the selectmen that are there, and or the other election officials are there so that this way they come to the consensus of how that vote should be counted. Jason, I know you tracked the cost of the recounts that you did in those three counties uh, and may or may not have sent an invoice. Um, but I am curious how that cost would compare to doing a, a machine or like if you were doing a, a, a machine audit um, and if there is a significant price difference uh, or cost difference in uh, hand counting versus uh, not hand counting? Um, you know, really most of the costs that we had were, um, you know, the cost of just traveling around the state, of, of getting the state planes lined up to fly people around. And so, you know, regardless of whether we're hand counting or machine counting, you know, if we're sending a team out to conduct a post-election audit, I think most of those costs are going to be there, whether you're, you know, hand counting or machine counting, even though the machine counting obviously goes faster. So the only, only data I have on that is from recounts. And so when a, a candidate requests a recount, they can decide, um, do I run them back through the machine or do I hand recount? And generally speaking, uh, hand recounts cost approximately five times what a machine count does based on staff paying the salaries of the board workers. It's, it doesn't take very long for uh, the machine to run through the ballots again, um, but it does take more time and way more people. So it, generally it's about five times the cost just in the context of recounts. So I agree that the cost of a hand recount is definitely more expensive, I think, than a, a machine audit. But that's how we've always we will always have done it. We will be undergoing risk eliminated audits this year too. For a state primary, we have to choose two polling locations, whether it's a city ward or a town. Um, and, but that's all going to be done by high speed scanner. The interesting thing, though, with us when we do our recounts, it is set in law as the charge that the candidate has to pay but all the ballots are being collected by the state. The state will go out and collect all the ballots from the city in our town for the recount that's necessary, and the recount is all done at the state level. So before I open it up um, for questions, uh, my last question to you, at least for right now, is how do you explain this to the public when you're when you're doing it, especially in an atmosphere where there is this sort of decreased trust towards those in, uh, engaged in administering the election, how do you explain 
these hand count or hand recount uh, procedures when you really are relying on the people who are there. So I'll start. Um, so these towns, again, in order to use a optical scan device, the, the city and or towns governing body needs to make the decision. So if they don't, don't wish to do that, then they don't need to use it. Um, but the main thing is transparency and openness. That is so huge. These are election officials who have been elected for, the, for New Hampshire. Our moderator clerks, our selectmen, our supervisors of our checklist, all our election, those election officials are elected by the people of their town. The ballot clerks are representative of each party and they are appointed. Everybody is taking an oath of office to uphold all the New Hampshire Constitution and all the laws of the, of the state of New Hampshire. So that includes that, but it's always very important to be state transparent in this process. Explain what you're doing. If you, whether you're a hand count town or a machine count town, if something happens, you need to be there explaining what is happening so that the public and the observers that are there know and trust what is happening and why there's a break in service. Why is this being questioned? That's very important. Yeah, I think it's been, you know, really positive, this post-election audit process that we've gone through. You know, one, it helped kind of, when we did it informally last year, it helped provide something of a response to, you know, sort of this conspiracy theory that was going around about, you know, ballots being switched electronically. And so, you know, we can, we can certainly talk till we're blue in the face about all our processes and all the controls we have on this and this really couldn't happen and how, you know, these machines are completely offline and so they can't be hacked. And, you know, the, the, <laughs> there was this one person the the Secretary of State was talking to and, and trying to explain this to him. And he's like, well, you know how they got into it, Bluetooth. Like that's, you know, Bluetooth, Bluetooth is magic. It, it allows you to get into, you know, in any machine. Um, so, you know, when, <clears throat> when given a choice, you know, I mean, I, I would rather, if, if somebody gives me something that's very specific, like some of that Lindell stuff was, where he came out with hard numbers for every single county in the country, this is how much got switched. Um, I can go out and I can ground truth that pretty easily. I'd rather just disprove it. And so, you know, that's what we were able to do with this. We're actually I go out, check these counties, do the hand count, uh, and and show, no, these these results were were pretty much dead on. I mean, you know, you're you're never gonna it's never gonna come out exactly the same, a machine count versus a hand recount, because you know, essentially there's different standards there and, and they make, I'll just say different kinds of errors. Like people make math errors. Machines don't generally make math errors. Uh, but you know, a machine is going to be less adept at determining voter intent than a human being is. And so, you know, you're going to have slight variances. When we did our post-election audit, uh, here at the end of May, after our primary, uh, we looked at about 20,000 ballots, and we ended up, our hand recount showed a discrepancy of seven. Um, and of those seven, we were able to explain six of them. So we felt pretty good about that, and we went out to the public and had some nice press releases, got some nice coverage in the media about how we had done this audit and essentially validated the integrity of our systems. So, and the fact that we had participation from both parties in the process, I think really helped too. It, quite frankly, it depends on the audience for us. There are absolutely a segment of our voting population that wants us to count every ballot, no matter what, ban the machine, count, vote Amish, count Amish. And so there's a, a segment of our population that loves it. Um, and yet they still want results by 10 o'clock at night, but we'll leave that alone. Um, but then there are others that um, aren't in favor of it. 
and I'll go back to something I said earlier, like we have a problem on when exactly we release those results because there's no law that dictates the timing. And so we at the state level and at the county level need to do a better job of telling the public when those take place and when they get included in the results. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest problem for us, but uh, definitely for a certain segment of the population, count them all by paper, count them all by hand. So. So I want to make sure we go to the NASA members in attendance. Um, does anyone have any questions? Mandy? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up um, on Brian's comment that he has a couple of counties that have decided to ban the use of tabulators. Um, we certainly had that attempted in, in New Mexico as well. We, we took a really strong position that we felt like that was outside of their authority and also against state law. Um, so I, I feel kind of grateful that we feel like we have that legal support. Um, I guess two big concerns come to mind, and I'm, I'm curious if you share those concerns, just accuracy. Um, you already mentioned the cost. And then thirdly, um, just kind of a delay in getting the results out. I'm just curious if you have any plans at this point to try to mitigate that. Uh, still working on it in 13 days, but we have the exact same concerns. Unfortunately, our law is not as clear as I would like it to be. The county election officers in charge, exclusively in charge of voting equipment, except the county commissioners are in charge of the budget. And so in these cases, and there's a three or four, maybe five, where the county commissioners have deleted the funding for the equipment out of their budget, and the county election office isn't equipped to absorb that. And we think they don't have the authority to do that, but we are not willing to challenge that in court, and especially in a contested primary. So we'll fight that fight later, but I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with everything you say. Yes, it is a concern on the accuracy. Um, with our post-election audit and comparing the hand count versus the uh, machine count, we've done it in six elections so far. And in every election, when we've been able to um, explain every discrepancy, normally, quite frankly, it's the machine not picking up a stray mark that's been the problem um, for the most part. But it takes time to do that. And with all of the pressure on getting election results on election night, that we are under specifically in Kansas, it's a big concern and I don't know quite frankly how we're going to do it. The obvious answer would be to hire more teams, just hire more groups of three. But in these jurisdictions, there aren't magic board worker fairy trees hanging around. So, um, you know, we're working through them. We're, we're encouraging other county offices to loan employees to comprise the board. The problem with that is that a lot of them are the same political party, so we're having trouble finding um, the other party to fill the boards. Uh, but quite frankly, I, I share your concerns, and I, I will tell you in 14 days how that goes. Other questions? So I've got, I've got one question. Um, actually, two questions. Uh, first one for... Uh, Jason, I know you mentioned um, that your office uh, sent sent people, paid for people to travel around to, to conduct the audits. Can you kind of clarify how much of a role does uh, your staff members play in, in the audit? Like how much of the audit are they conducting? How much is the county conducted? And how, how much is kind of a partnership or combination? And then um, the other one that I have for, for Brian, and this is kind of out of out of curiosity, for the five counties that are reverting to hand counting, generally, I don't need an exact number, but just out of curiosity, how long are the ballots going to be for those? Yeah, the uh, the post-election audit that we just uh, conducted in in late May, and and you know, it's it's in Idaho code now. Um, you know, it it's our audit, so you know, it's not. In fact. Um, <laughs> On the, on the night that we do the random draw of counties and precincts, uh, we, we immediately contact not just the clerk to let them know that they got picked, uh, but we contact the sheriff, and the sheriff immediately impounds all of the affected ballots, which is actually identical to the recount process. You know, when a recount gets requested, 
uh, they request that. It's actually under the attorney general. They request the recount of, and the, and the attorney general immediately orders the sheriff to impound the ballot. So they're really, um, certainly the, the county clerk's office, uh, you know, is is helpful to us in that process, but they're not even in possession of the ballots anymore. And it's our team that we send out, which consists of, you know, one Secretary of State employee and a, a Republican and a Democrat, you know, appointed by the, the state, those two state parties that are actually going to conduct it. So, uh, you know, the, the clerk is really more of a kind of a, a resource or, or an observer, uh, you know, somebody that we can ask questions of if we don't understand something that we're looking at uh, or have questions about how these ballots are organized. Um, you know, we can, we can ask them and, and, you know, they've been helpful to us. But it's, you know, we kind of felt like, you know, if this is going to be a, a proper post-election audit, you know, it shouldn't be the person who conducted the election who's also conducting the audit. And since in Idaho, the elections, you know, were pretty decentralized, they are conducted by the clerks. They're not really conducted by our office. We just receive the numbers from them. Uh, you know, it was important to have, uh, you know, kind of a third party come in and conduct that audit. And so we are that third party. For the primary election, um, each county will have between 18 and 20 um, candidates and um, races plus special question. And then the general election, it will be twice that. Um, so I'm worried about both of those, quite honestly. Have you met my legislature? <laughs> Karen, I saw you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, two questions. First is sort of a nerdy one. Uh, do y'all tally over and under votes? And uh, then also, I know Jason's touched on it, but maybe Trisha um, and Brian a little bit more, the accuracy that you're seeing when you recount hand counts, or do you, or what do you find when you audit hand counts? So as far as the auditing of the recounts and everything goes, we, we do both. We have, except for the incident that happened in 2020 with the town of Wyndham, um, New Hampshire, in one of the races for a machine counts, the first time we've ever been off like that. But normally it's the hand count counts that we'll see sometimes the most errors. And we did have, during that 2020 election, we did have the recount um, issue where um, we did have one town that was off higher than if that didn't happen in the town of Wyndham would have been the highest one. It's still not overall that hard. It's just very easy to put that stack of 25 or 50 ballots in the wrong location. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the first question. Do you tally over and under votes? Yes, we do. Yeah. And like I said, starting this year, uh, for those that have the... Um, Optical devices, are, which New Hampshire has the AccuVote still, which as everybody knows, they get called into the question because it's Dominion. Um, they will now have to t definitely tally that and keep, uh, put, so not only do our hand count counts, but the machine counts will also have to tell us how many overvoted ballots they have. So on the second part of that question, they are not required to report that to the state. I know that they do, but we don't ask, nor, nor do we collect undervote and overvotes on the hand counts. Um, as far as accuracy goes, through six post-election audits, we have forced each jurisdiction to reconcile to zero. Um, it's taken some work on two of those, but eventually we have. It's my experience that it's about 50-50 between error on the human and error on the machine. And when it comes to error on the machine, it's almost always a stray mark or someone who did not darken in the oval enough. Um, and we were able to verify that. Um, human error is easier to find because of the requirement that we have two people, we have two different sets of tally sheets. Um, but so far, it's just about 50-50. Uh, yeah, we, we do track the, the, or, you know, when we're doing our, our post-election audit hand recount, 
uh, we do keep track of how many overvotes and undervotes we're seeing in those ballots that we're looking at because what that enables us to do is once we've got, you know, we know how many votes there were for each of the candidates and we know how many overvotes and undervotes there were by precinct, you know, we can, we can actually then compare those totals back to their, their ballot inventory that they keep. And so, you know, it's a nice way when you're doing an audit to kind of tie everything together and you can essentially account for every ballot. Uh, you know, we're, <coughs> I think we see kind of the same thing on the, the accuracy front where it's like, you know, the, one of the counties we looked at that what was a hand count county, uh, we had this discrepancy of uh, about 10. Um, and, you know, we had a, a heck of a time finding it and, and why it was there. Well, we eventually found that when they had originally tallied on election night in this one particular precinct, this is a very small county, and this was the smallest precinct in this very small county, but, you know, it was the presidential race, so it's the biggest turnout they've got, you know, their tally sheets at the each column essentially has space for 10 votes. And, and at the top of each column is a header, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and you kind of work your way across. Well, what, <laughs> what they had done was for, in this particular precinct, uh, all of the Republican candidates who in this precinct and in this county had a lot of votes, this was a very rural county, um, you know, they had, they had looked at the number at the top and they saw like 170. And then they, you know, and that was the last column with marks in it. And then they went down and saw three hashes and they recorded 173. Well, you know, each column, those headers, that represents how many votes you have when that box is full. And so, you know, that, that candidate actually had 163 votes, not 173 votes. Now, you know, so they, they had an extra 10 votes for Trump there, um, which, you know, didn't, didn't fit with the narrative we were getting from the, the pillow guy. But, um, <laughs> but you know, the, the Biden vote was, was correct because they didn't use the headers because they could just look at the hash marks and see that there were like 13 votes there. And, and it was consistently all that way. All the other races we looked at were that way. All the Republican candidates who had lots and lots of hash marks across the, the tally sheet all had an extra 10 votes. And they just, they misused the, the tally sheet. And it was the same error over and over and over again. So, you know, that's the kind of mistake that you make when you've got hand counts. And, and then we looked, we did the audit in another county that does a machine count, and they were also off by like, you know, eight or nine. And in that case, it was, you know, we, we found like eight or nine ballots where, you know, there were markings, but they were really, really, really faint. And, and in looking at them, it's like, yeah, there's, I, I'm sure the machine didn't pick these markings up. And so that was the difference. And so, yeah, I mean, same kind of thing. It's kind of a 50-50 thing. You know, they just, the machine and the humans make different kinds of mistakes. Suzanne, what kind of time frame do you do your post-election audits in? Like, do you do it, does it have to be done before your canvas? What kind of time frames do you go by? We start on the Thursday after the election and counties can begin certifying on Monday, we have to sign off on the audit before they can be begin their canvas. So we work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, until, but the counties cannot certify until we've signed off on the audit. So in New Hampshire, we're just starting them this year. The audits have to be completed by 12 noon on the Friday after following the election because the candidate has until five o'clock that evening to file for a recount. Yeah, we actually don't, we do our, our random draw of counties and precincts that we're gonna look at. We don't do that until the evening after the 5 p.m. deadline of when the counties have to have their canvases certified and turned into us, which is, you know, either seven, 
or 10 days after the election, depending on what kind of an election it is. So, you know, primaries, it's seven days later. Uh, general, it's it's 10 days later. At that point, we do our draw. Now, the, the law doesn't have any particular deadline for when we have to be done by, but we try to be finished by, well, before we have to do our state canvas. So, you know, we want to make sure that, I mean, if we were to find some kind of problem, that that problem is known before the state canvas takes place and hopefully resolved. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty tight window there. We've got basically about seven days uh, in the case of a primary and four days in the case of a general election to get this audit done, which is why we're using the state plane and flying all over the state. Um, but it's, uh, and there's also, you know, within that either seven or four day window also includes a weekend. So that's, that's another complication, but we, we try and do it pretty quick. Well, I want to thank our uh, panelists for sharing uh, your expertise. I uh, said during our, our prep calls that this is a very NASA uh, sweet spot kind of session because it's extremely nerdy. Um, so uh, thank you all. Um, we uh, are moving now to a break. Um, so there are snacks in the other room. Um, and we'll be on break until 3.45. Um, and a reminder that this is um, pretty much your, your last chance to uh, check out the exhibitors. Um, so please be sure to swing by uh, before they uh, start heading home. So we'll be back at 3.45.